Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, announce that we are now going to have our keynote speaker from uh, John Sawyer, who is Executive Director of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. And I just want to personally thank you for coming all this way. I know you're very busy uh, with all your commitments and to uh, talk about this very important topic, old values, new values, and how we build a bridge between them. So I'll let Deb uh, say a few words also. Deb Blum uh, of our uh, journalism school uh, will introduce John. Thank you. Uh, John Sawyer is founding director of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, which is a nonprofit organization that funds independent international reporting. Basically, the idea is it supports the kind of in-depth international reporting that American media outlets do less and less of today as budgets are cut and as we tend to be more uh, self-focused in some cases. Uh, he was previously the Washington bureau chief for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, where he led the paper's international reporting efforts and actually filed stories for more than five dozen countries. His work has been honored by the Overseas Press Club, by investigative reporters and editors, and he won the National Press Club's Prize, Press Club's Prize for Best Foreign Reporting for three years in a row. The center itself provides grants to support reporting projects in other regions of the globe with a special emphasis on stories underreported in the mainstream media. Uh, what kind of stories are we talking about? You'll notice that this is a center for crisis reporting, but it doesn't necessarily mean war reporting or natural disaster reporting. The center's website says, in fact, our definition of crisis is broad. We see great value in covering the two often underreported systemic level crises from environmental issues and struggles for resources or human rights abuses. In that context, if you look at the kinds of stories that the center has reported, you'll find African water shortages, drug violence in Mexico, global climate change in Alaska, desertification in China, and the sex trade in Thailand. All of this illuminating our complex planet and its equally complex societies. Is this easy terrain to navigate? Absolutely not. I've been doing international journalism on myself on a much, for, for myself on a much smaller scale, uh, partnering American science journalists with Arab science journalists, and we find ourselves constantly trying to figure out the tricky relationships and cultural contexts of what we're doing. Uh, so it's so that doing international reporting in a sense where you are both trying to illuminate often controversial issues and at the same time respect the local culture and society poses some unique challenges, both logistical and ethical. And in fact, it's the latter challenge, the ethical challenge I know, in particular a specific case study that Mr. Sawyer hopes to raise with you today. So please welcome our keynote speaker, John Sawyer. Thank you, Deborah and Stephen. It's um, great to be here. I, I am going to be talking about a, a specific case, and I, I think in a bit, this, in a way, this is a counterpoint to the discussion we had this morning, and that I'm talking about something that we've been dealing with in, in the past uh, several weeks uh, at the Pulitzer Center on one of our projects, and some of the questions that have arisen about it. Uh, I, I, normally, I stand up and I, I can talk for as long as you let me on the Pulitzer Center and the work that we do. Uh, this, this subject has been uh, rather fraught for us uh, as we've dealt with it over the last few weeks. And so I've, I've actually I've prepared, this is very much a prepared uh, talk, and I'll, I'll, I'll stick pretty closely to it and kind of walk you through, and, and, and I'm eager to see what you make of it, because I think, I think there are lessons here uh, for, for all of us who are in the business of creating uh, these new journalism entities. I was honored and pleased when, when Stephen Ward asked me to give this talk. Uh, it's a subject close to home, uh, this question of how we maintain journalism standards in the midst of profound journalism change. When traditional news media gatekeepers hold vastly less sway than in decades past, and when public discourse is increasingly driven by partisan voices that ricochet across the web without regard to attribution, verification, or accountability. It is also a time, of course, of unprecedented access to information and avenues for public engagement 
and public engagement and debate that were unthinkable before the advent of the internet. In the four years since we created the Pulitzer Center, uh, I have often said that we cannot change these new realities. I've said that what we can do and what we must do is hold firm to the journalism standards that matter. And that as we create new financial or editorial models of journalism, we be ever mindful that we are also collectively creating the ethical ground rules for this new journalism too. One reason I welcome the opportunity to address these issues is because for these four years, I felt comfortably on the side of the angels, the founder of a nonprofit journalism center uh, backed by individuals and foundations committed to in-depth, fair reporting on big, systemic, global issues with a special emphasis on topics and places that traditional news media outlets have been increasingly less able or less willing to address on their own. We've identified strong journalists with important stories. We've given them the dollars needed to get out in the field, served as agents in helping to place the stories in high-end news outlets, and then deployed them and their work to schools, universities, and other public fora to engage the widest possible audience. We've used the internet to amplify the journalist's voice, creating interactive web portals that address big issues like food, let me pull one of these up, food and water, climate change and HIV AIDS, fragile states and women and children in crisis. And we structured the portals so as to give visitors the opportunity for direct interaction with journalists and to share their own voices as part of a global conversation that is grounded in substantive, vetted journalism. In all of this, we think we are on the side of the angels, building a model that we think has value and can be sustained. And before I'm done, I want to come back to some specific examples of how this works in practice. But I want to begin with something less comfortable, a project we sponsored that has exposed us to attack on the very subject of this conference, our ethics and our commitment to basic journalism standards. I do not think we were unethical in how we approached the project, nor do I think we violated those standards. We did make mistakes, however, mistakes which we have tried to redress and for which we have publicly apologized. We've learned some painful lessons, lessons that speak not just to the Pulitzer Center, but to the new journalism ecosystem we are all engaged in building. I want to explore these lessons in detail and what we see as fixes that need to be made. I know that some of my colleagues here are well ahead of us in thinking these issues through. I look to you all for guidance and advice, and I welcome the opportunity for question and debate. But enough preamble. I'll give you the headline. At least the headline is reported this past Monday in a tweet on, from one of my favorite programs on the media. It went like this. Pulitzer Center Photog pays Ugandan family to exhume and take pictures of child's body. Pulitzer Center apologizes. Now, on the media, to its credit, uh, corrected what was a misstatement. That was actually not correct, the original tweet. The statement to which it linked, issued in my name and published on our website, April 21st, explicitly said that we did not believe payment had been made to exhume a body in Uganda. But the statement also acknowledged that a body had been exhumed, that our website had displayed one of the photographs of that body, and that after five days, we had concluded it was a mistake to take or display that image. We took responsibility for some other mistakes as well, to which I'll return, but we also said that we would stand behind the project and continue the work. How we got to these decisions and some of the lessons we've learned is what I hope to address today. Uh, this is an example from Developing Story, a, a blog on, on journalism from a former BBC producer, uh, which has the, the uh, unmellifluous headline of Pulitzer Center Crisis in Ethics, which captures some of the coverage of this event. 
The Uganda project is one of the darkest we have tackled. The growing incidence of ritual child sacrifice across several countries of Africa and the abuse, mutilation, and murder of children to which it is led. There is no doubt as to the seriousness of the crimes involved. The participation in this profitable market by fraudulent faith healers, and until recently a dearth of coverage even in local news media markets. It is among the most horrific crimes I have encountered and one desperately in need of public exposure and effective government response. The issue was brought to our attention by Marco Vernacci, an Italian photographer based in Buenos Aires. We've worked closely with Marco for more than a year, first on a project on narco trafficking in the West African country of Guinea-Bissau, and more recently a global examination of maternal mortality that included work Marco had done in Guinea-Bissau. But the Child Sacrifice Project is not one that we had chosen to fund, at least initially. We'd given Marco a grant to work on a different project, continuing the work he had already begun on maternal mortality. He had planned to report first from Nigeria and then move on to the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Central African Republic, Ghana, and beyond. Marco ran into visa problems in Nigeria, however, and decided first to focus on Uganda, where he arrived last January for a two-month stay. He was clear to us from the outset that he planned to pursue the child, which child sacrifice story as well, and that he hoped eventually we would also be able to fund that project. Along the way, he had given us detailed emails laying out the proposed project on child sacrifice. It was clear that he had done significant research and had contacts across the continent. Our challenge was that we were swamped with other projects, and as far as Marco was concerned, we were committed to completing the maternal mortality project first. We didn't hear from Marco the first several weeks uh, that he was in Uganda, but then there was a stream of emails and lots of drama. In late January, all of his equipment was stolen. Nikon agreed to cover most of the cost of replacing the equipment, largely on the basis of Marco's reputation, a reputation that grew larger still with the, the announcement that month that he had won World Press Photo's top prize in the general news stories category for the work he had done with us in Guinea-Bissau on narco trafficking. A few days later, in mid-February, he wrote that he had failed in his efforts to gain access to the clinics and hospitals he needed to tell the maternal mortality story. A few days after that, he wrote to say that he had made progress on the child sacrifice story and forwarded a link to his initial gallery of photographs. He had documented 11 cases of child abuse or murder from the past two months, he said, including one case of three siblings killed in a single incident and another that involved a 10-year-old girl whose arm and leg had been chopped off and her skull hacked open. Marcus said he wanted to continue his investigations in the Democratic Republic of Congo on both projects, but that he was out of money and needed more support from us. At that point, I again said no, partly because I said we needed more information on the full scope of the Child Sacrifice Project, and partly because our first priority remained maternal mortality. He sent us another detailed memo at that point outlining a project that would include a video documentary and book as well as a web presentation. And he referenced the strong interest he had received in publishing this project from some of the most important news outlets in the world. What these outlets did not offer, however, was the money Marco needed to continue the project. So he went home to Buenos Aires and began working on the material he had gathered already. It was at this point, months into his work, that I said we would consider making the Child Sacrifice Project a Pulitzer Center project, creating a project page on our site to promote the work and designating the $15,000 that we had initially committed to the maternal project, maternal mortality project, to this work instead. Marcus sent me a link to an updated uh, photo gallery of the project to date, but I did not review the gallery in detail until another two weeks had passed. It was not until a phone conversation with Marco in early this month that we agreed to associate ourselves with the project and to feature it on our site. 
Would we have funded this project had it come to us in the usual way, as an advanced proposal to support field work on a topic of interest to us? I'm confident we would have done so. Marco was someone we knew well, whom we trusted and admired. In similar situations with previous journalist grantees, we have often made quick decisions to fund additional work without detailed vetting of a specific proposal. But this case was different in that when we made the commitment, Marco had already completed his Uganda field work. And in this case, our failure to thoroughly vet the work he had done was a major disservice to us both. Here's why. In that photo gallery, I too quickly reviewed were three photos that should have set off alarm bells right and left. One showed the mutilated body of that 10-year-old girl, missing an arm and leg and the back of her head sliced open. Another showed a shrouded corpse in an open wooden coffin. A third showed a three-year-old boy naked with a catheter emerging from where his penis had been chopped away. The photos were shocking and haunting. They convey in the most visceral way the enormity of the crimes that had been committed. I had no doubt that publishing these photos would bring attention to what was happening. I did not consider nearly enough, nor discuss with Marco, the circumstances in which they were taken, or the wisdom of making them public. Now, Marco gave his explanation in, in a series of three articles he wrote for our blog, Untold Stories, which we posted on April 16th. We were following here the same model as on the Guinea-Bissau project a year ago, where I worked with Marco on a series of untold stories posts that gave a detailed account of how he came to take those photographs. On Uganda, we wanted to post the articles in advance of the scheduled publication that weekend in the London Sunday Times of the first of Marco's photographs from the Child Sacrifice Project, not including one of these three, but from the overall project and plans by the Times to feature a more complete gallery of the photos online. We also wanted to respond to criticism of the project on a few photojournalism blogs that began to surface that week. In the three articles posted on April 16th and a subsequent article posted on April 25th, Marco explained that the photograph of Margaret Babiri Nankia, the 10-year-old murdered girl, was taken several hours after her burial, that the body had been exhumed at his request. He also wrote that after photographing the body and videotaping an interview with the child's mother, he was asked by her and by a village elder who was present for help in obtaining a lawyer to pursue the case. He wrote that he, quote, emptied his wallet, giving her about $70. On the case of Mukisa, the three-year-old mutilated child, Marco wrote that he had taken photographs showing the extent of his wounds at the request of the child's parents, who wanted justice in his case and who also hoped that publicity would bring contributions for the medical care the child would need. The photograph of the open coffin with the shrouded corpse was taken earlier, also after an exhumation conducted at Marco's request and with the consent of the family. In the case of Margaret Babiri, Marco wrote that he had acted in the emotion of the moment. In the earlier case, he said he had consulted first with local police officers who told him that so long as the family agreed, they had no objection to the exhumation. In our conversation since, Marco has said that in his view, the fact that the bodies were exhumed uh, had been exhumed was irrelevant, that what mattered was documenting the mutilation of children. It was this search for visual evidence that led him to the decisions he made, he said, a desire to evoke this crime in a way that would compel public attention and response. Now, a number of critics addressing this issue on Facebook and on photojournalism blogs fiercely disagreed. They argued that such exhumation could never be justified, that such images would never have been displayed had the victims been Americans, 
that the entire project was an exercise in sensationalism that exploited vulnerable people. These are serious issues, to be sure, but on balance, at least initially, we came down on the side of publishing the photographs. Several critics raised additional objections that in the initial photograph, captions on his own website, Marco had misstated the names and details on some of the cases, and that according to a statement by the chief of the anti-human sacrifice unit of the Ugandan police force, the Marco's cash gift to the family of Margaret Babiri was in fact payment for the exhumation. We believe the mistaken details were innocent errors. I followed up with the police chief myself, who acknowledged that his statement about Marco's payment for the exhumation was pure speculation, that he had not been on the scene himself and had no way of knowing what the circumstances were. We ran on our site the photograph of Margaret Babiri on a jump page after a warning that the image was graphic. We did not run an image of the naked child, Mukisa, but we did include a link out to Marco's photo gallery where it could be viewed. We did not run an image of the open coffin. Five days later, we decided to take the images down from our site as well as Marco's and to issue a public statement of apology. We were influenced in part by the debate on the blogs, in part by our own intense reflection and Marco's on the issues raised. In the case of the three-year-old child, we said in the statement that we had concluded that publicizing the crime did not warrant distribution of images that violated the rights of a child to dignity and privacy. In the case of Margaret Babiri, we said we had concluded and that Marco agreed that, quote, it was wrong to ask that the body be exhumed. It showed disrespect for the dead and forced a grieving family to suffer anew. It also had the effect of focusing attention on the actions of one journalist, we added, as opposed to a horrific crime that needs to be exposed. Some of our critics have said we have not gone far enough, that because of the exhumations and other issues, we should disavow the project entirely. We disagree. The project is bigger than these controversial images. Last weekend, we posted Marco's video interview with Ugandan lawyer Richard Omangole, former country director of Amnesty International, who made clear how serious an issue child sacrifice is. And the failures in law enforcement and public policy that have driven the families of victims to seek recourse through the news media. We also posted Marco's video interview with the mother and brother of Margaret Babiri. We look forward soon to the publication of Marco's full project, examining the multiple dimensions of a crime that touches everyone from street children to so-called faith healers to well-established church and business leaders in a country where, according to a Pew survey earlier this month, 40% of the people believe in witchcraft. I said in our statement last week that, quote, in the course of this project so far, we have learned some painful, useful lessons about the ambiguous intersections of freelance journalism, blog posts, and articles that are published or broadcast. Some of our critics took that as an attack on them or on the blogosphere, but it was not intended as such. Untold Stories, uh, after all, is itself a blog, a showcase for the work of journalists we support who are either still in the field or just returned. What I was trying to get at was a shift in editorial responsibility and in the economic climate for journalists that affect us all. Now, on the lesson side, I would start with the obvious, that the internet is both blessing and curse and must be approached as such. The controversy over Marco's photographs and his methods took place entirely on the web, in advance of publication or broadcast on any mass media outlet. It has been constructive in that it has led to a quick decision to withdraw the photographs in question now and henceforth. To the extent that damage has been done, 
it is hopefully less than would have been the case had the photographs been printed and distributed. The blog debates were certainly useful feedback for us, and I want to acknowledge that. Those debates, regrettably and perhaps inevitably, given the nature of the web, were also full of half-truths, distortions, and personal attacks, and too often had the feel of a mob more intent on destroying one photographer than on addressing the subject of his reporting. I find it disconcerting that we are talking about the method and not about the facts. One blogger wrote on the website of the Italian newspaper La Repubblica earlier this week, it is shocking to see that we are questioning the photographer's ethics, but we are ignoring the atrocities he's documenting. Think about that little girl, about her relatives, about those who loved her. Another lesson is the increased responsibility that organizations like ours must take for the editorial supervision of the work that we support. As the Pulitzer Center has grown, our websites are more than just archives for work that we have sponsored to be published or broadcast by other larger news organizations. Our Untold Stories blog consists of reports from journalists in the field and from staff members, original content that is posted sometimes two and three times a day and that currently constitutes roughly a third of our total internet traffic. Some of these untold stories posts come from journalists we are funding who are on staff with print or broadcast partners, as is the case with our collaborations with NewsHour, special correspondent Fred DeSam Lazaro on water, food, uh, or Sudan. Some are freelancers for whom we have helped negotiate long-term relationships with a specific outlet, as is the case with Beck Hamilton, a lawyer journalist who will be making multiple trips to Sudan this year, funded by us as a special correspondent for the Washington Post. Some of our grantees are freelancers who have established their own relationship with editors and outlets, as is the case with the project on illegal gold miners in French Guiana that Damon Tabor and Narayan Mahan are completing for Harper's Magazine. In such cases, editors at the outlets rightly take the lead in directing the journalism. But in other instances, and this gets to the economic climate in which we're in, an increasing proportion of our work, freelancers come to us with proposals for travel support on projects with no guaranteed outlet in advance. This is, of course, a function of the ongoing retrenchment at most news media outlets, a drying up both of funds for travel and of the editorial uh, personnel required to supervise freelance stringers and nurture the development of their careers. Organizations like the Pulitzer Center have increasingly come to play that role ourselves, sounding boards as to story ideas and guidance along the way on projects that often don't get to potential old media outlets until they are all but done. We have taken this responsibility seriously, working closely with our journalist grantees and helping as best we can to shape their projects. We were deeply involved with Michael Cavanaugh's reporting from Eastern Congo, for example, a project that entailed three month-long trips and multi-platform reporting. It won the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Best Reporting on Television on International Human Rights and an Edward R. Murrow Award for Radio. On another project, investigating health and safety hazards in Chinese factories, we collaborated closely with our grantee, Loretta Tofani, on a project that required five trips to China over 14 months, and for most of that time, had no assured outlet or editorial supervision beyond the Pulitzer Center. The series eventually ran in the Salt Lake Tribune in late 2007. It swept most of the major prizes that year for investigative reporting, among them a gold medal from investigative reporters and editors. We directly supervised an even more ambitious project on HIV AIDS in Jamaica, one that entailed original poetry, music, photography, and videography, short and long print essays, video segments for public television, a nationally distributed radio documentary, and an immersive web experience that won an Emmy last fall for new approaches to news and documentaries. Now, of course, it was easier to sustain these direct, 
close relationships when the Pulitzer Center was funding eight or 10 or 20 projects a year. Uh, last year, we funded nearly 50, half of them including video elements for public television. Our staff has grown over these past four years from just me in the beginning to two, three, five, and now 10 full-time staff, half of them paid interns. But much of their work is about promoting and marketing projects after completion as we seek together to engage the broadest possible audience in the big systemic issues our journalists cover. One of the lessons of the Uganda project is that we are short on staff for direct editorial supervision. I don't mean to suggest that we had no conversation with Marco Vernaschi. My inbox contains 477 emails from him in the past 15 months. I do believe that we were distracted by other projects, other responsibilities, and did not give the Child Sacrifice Project the thorough vetting it deserved. Another lesson related is that we need to be much more explicit as to the statement of editorial standards. I think looking back that we have taken them for granted far too much, asserting that we were committed to the quote highest journalism standards or to quote raising the quality of international reporting without spelling out what we meant. From the beginning we were pitching projects toward publication or broadcast in high-end name brand outlets. I think we assumed again too easily that if our projects appeared in time, the Christian Science Monitor, PBS NewsHour, and, and others of that quality, then journalists and the public alike would recognize the standards we hope to meet. We assume too much. An urgent task before us now is to spell out explicit standards in our criteria for grants and as part of our mission statement to make clear where we stand. I want to recognize here the great service of Stephen Ward, Brent Houston, and our other colleagues uh, in the report released this morning, the Ethics for the New Investigative Newsroom. It's an invaluable discussion of the challenges we, we all face in the establishment of these new journalism entities and a practical guide as to the specific steps we each need to take. I should note here that in particular the report's focus on funding and transparency two subjects that were not at issue in the Uganda project, but hugely important, in my view, and as we heard this morning, both to the Pulitzer Center and to all of the initiatives that have sprung to life in recent years. We were highly fortunate that we began with a seed grant from the members of the Pulitzer family, uh, who very much shared our commitment to multiple voices on big issues, big global issues, and a determination that the journalism we funded be absolutely independent. They have since put their support on a semi-permanent basis, assuring a stable funding for just under half of our current budget. The Pulitzers have served as equally well as model donors, demonstrating by their actions the kind and terms of funding we could accept from other foundations and individuals. We have built our funding base on multiple legs, from foundations interested in our educational outreach to traditional news media donors to foundations with an interest in raising the visibility of specific issues. We have acquired this funding support because donors believe we are successful in crafting news media and outreach campaigns for sustained visibility and engagement on issues of interest to us both. The process has succeeded so far because the donors also understand that the journalism we fund has to remain independent of any special influence, including theirs. We share the new report's commitment to transparency. We make public our list of donors and will continue to do so. The last lesson I would draw from our recent experience is that as we get bigger, we need to hold firm to our own core values. The Pulitzer Center is an unusual hybrid organization, to my mind, unlike most of the new uh, journalism organizations that have been built on the ashes of old media's collapse. We are a significant funder producer of original journalism content, to be sure, but we are more than that. At one level, we serve as an agent for our journalist grantees, 
matching them with outlets willing to pay for their stories. We also work with them to expose their work as broadly as possible, not just on various news media outlets, but via appearances at schools and universities and through the interactive portals we have built for distribution on the web. This week, three of our journalists and two of my staff colleagues have been in St. Louis speaking about Haiti and Afghanistan and a dozen schools and three universities. Two of our journalists were at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, uh, earlier this week as part of our campus consortium program that brings Pulitzer Center journalists on campus twice a year to discuss their topics and give students at participating universities the chance to compete for Pulitzer Center travel reporting fellowships. Next week, we'll bring to Washington the five winners of this, of this year's uh, Project Report, a video reporting contest in collaboration with YouTube, Sony, and Intel that gives aspiring journalists the opportunity to compete for $10,000 travel reporting fellowships and to have their work featured on YouTube in the context of the Pulitzer Center's work with professional journalists. We are working hard to make our gateway web portals a continuing presence at any school, anywhere, giving students the opportunity to engage the issues via top grade journalism, to interact online with journalists and with other students, and to post their own take on the issues through our YouTube and Google Maps based Share Your Stories. But the outreach and engagement we champion is only as good as the journalism on which it is based. The Child Sacrifice Project I have discussed today is very good journalism on a topic of great import that goes to the heart of our mission of shedding light on issues that would otherwise go unreported. My hope is that in being open about our mistakes in the execution of this project and moving to rectify them, we can restore the focus where it should be on bringing an end to the abuse of children in Uganda, an abuse that Marco Vernaschi has eloquently documented. So that's, that's my case study, and um, more or less in real time, that's sort of playing out in the last few weeks. Um, I, welcome, I welcome your questions on, on, on that project, or the Pulitzer Center model, or any other questions. Thank you very much. If you have a question, please put up your hand and a microphone that looks exactly like the one I'm holding will be brought to you. Please, when you do ask a question, identify yourself uh, for the record. Katie. I have my own one. Thanks, Deb. Uh, this is actually from the Augustana College um, uh, Media Law. I'm just meeting right now and watching you <laughs> online. I'm sorry, um, where, Katie, where are they? I'm sorry, at where? Augustana in Illinois. Oh, okay. Um, our students feel that perhaps organizations such as the Pulitzer Center should not be funding so many journalistic endeavors if they can't reasonably manage and vet them. Such institutions, however worthy it is for such undertakings, need to know their own limits just as newspapers and broadcast stations do. We wonder what further steps you would have taken had you had more manpower and more time. Um, I, I agree with that. And as part, part of what I was trying to state was a plea for more resources on the staff side, that, because we, I think we need, we need that uh, to, to uh, properly vet and supervise all of our projects. The reason that, you know, when I, when I set up the Pulitzer Center, my idea was that we would never do more than six or so projects a year, and that, that it, when I, and I, you know, rather naively thought that I would do one or two of them myself, and it'd be sort of a, a little, um, a boutique operation that would be kind of a model of how to do uh, international projects. And what happened was that, that we had, you know, we, this is early 2006, and, and as we were getting off the ground and starting and beginning to get a few proposals and doing projects, the traditional support for this kind of work was collapsing all over the country. And my first idea was that mostly we would be funding staff reporters at newspapers like my old newspaper the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and, and I, I built a career of, of enterprise reporting on uh, international topics uh, in part through small grants over the years that I got to, to like, you know, say I get a grant to go to a conference in Moscow, and it, that paid for me to be there for five days, and I, I, then I negotiated that into a 
five or six week trip with, with my editors. And, and then as I did some of these projects, I had leverage to do more of the projects. And so the idea was we were gonna, we were gonna kind of in, empower the next generation of younger journalists like me to be at these regional, big regional papers that uh, would be, give us an alternative voice to the, to the big national media. And what's happened over the last four years is that most of those regional newspapers have simply quit doing this kind of work. I mean, they don't even have, in many cases, they don't even have foreign editors. They don't have, they don't have the personnel to supervise. They don't have staff who are interested in, and let alone have money or space to run these stories. And so as we have grown, we get more and more proposals, and we've, and we've succe succeeded in, in, in raising a, a good bit of money to support this work, uh, and there's a huge need. We see these stories, these proposals coming in, there's no coverage, there's not, there's not coverage happening, and we know that if we fund the work, that there's a good chance that we can find an outlet. And over time, our outlets have gotten to be more and more um, high-end, because more and more high-end outlets don't have the resources themselves to do this work. So that, that, that combination of circumstances has let, led us into a situation where, where we really are probably doing more than we can effectively manage. And, and that's, you know, that needs to be redressed. And, we're, and in, the wake of this, in the wake of this instance, we're, we're giving a lot of hard thought to how we do that. Do we cut back on the number of projects? Do we, do we try to bring in more people to, to help in the supervision of the project? As to the second part of the question, what, what would have been different I think if we had had a full discussion of how those photographs were taken and how they came about, we would have come to the conclusion before we referenced them on our website that they were inappropriate to be part of the project. And, and that's, that's a very simple thing. That's a discussion that we should have had with Marco. But Marco, we, you know, this, the, the whole the, the sequence of events moved so quickly over the last month that he was ahead of us in what he had done. He had sort of already sorted through and made these decisions. I wasn't fully aware of the extent of all of it. And so as the, and, and we, we kind of became aware of it almost at the point that we were publishing it. And I think there was not enough time. We should have just stopped and, and had more discussion. Question here? The microphone coming. I had a question about um, what kind of consequences were there for um, this photojournalist afterwards? Not just what, what uh, kind of what consequences? Um, you know about about some of the missteps. As it sounds like, you know, you thought there were. You know, it wasn't ideal the way that uh, that came about. Those photos were there consequences for him beyond just um, some sort of sanctioning. I mean, will this affect his career at all? Likely or well, it's hard. It's hard to say. I don't. I don't. My personal opinion is no. I mean, the, he's, he's in Amsterdam this weekend receiving the World Press Photo Prize for, for the best um, general news stories photo of the year on the Guinea-Bissau project. And, and my understanding is that the conversations he's in with, with editors at, at a number of leading news organizations, they're, they're proceeding on, the, on this story, but without, without these three images. We're talking about three images out of, out of 70. And, and there is, yes, there is debate. This is, if, you, if you go on to, the, to, the, to our site and link out to the, to the blog debates on this, in some photojournalism blogs, there is a huge debate going on about do you ever, in any circumstances, exhume a body? And there's an equally fierce cadre of people, including senior editors at, at, at some of our best publications, that say, yes, sometimes you would. And in, in, in the case, particularly in the case of, of Margaret Babiri, the, the 10-year-old girl, who had, I mean, Marco hears about that situation uh, at early evening in Kampala from another uh, local journalist, and, they, and he's told that's, that this girl has been murdered the night before, and it's in a village about an hour outside Kampala. He immediately leaves the restaurant where they were. They, he goes with local journalists to the village. Uh, he meets the, the mother. He hears the story. The family members and the village elder who's there or you know, telling him just how bad this crime was, they've just buried her a few hours before, and they, it's, they buried her in you know, loose dirt, you know, two and a half feet under the surface of the ground. And so in the conversation, Marco, who has already been, at this point, he's been in Uganda for a month, he's been working with local police, he's been working with local NGOs, he knows a lot about this story, he's already documented a number of other cases, and, and he shows the, the family and the village elder what he's trying to do, that he's trying to document 
the extent of this crime. And, and they, in the course of this conversation, he says, you know, I really need a picture. I need to show what Margaret looks like. And, and they agree. And so they, they exhume the body. Now, technically, that is illegal in, in Uganda. But the, the, Marco you know, tells the police, the head of the anti uh, human sacrifice department that, that Uganda has set up because this is a, a, a serious issue that's emerged in the last year or two in Uganda. He knows about it the next day. He doesn't take action against Marco. He disagrees. He thinks that maybe he should not have done it, but he understands why he did it. And, you know, so I don't, I don't know that there's going to be, I don't suspect any particular sanction, and, and I don't know that this is a, an easily resolvable issue. For our part, we came down on the side of saying that we shouldn't have done it. If I'll. Um, the reason I ask is, um, um, you know, I'm actually a sociologist, but I'm really interested in, in journalism. And um, the, the thing, um, you know, the, the, the idea that the end justifies the mean, and that's a simplistic way of everything that occurred, but, um, you know, for a sociologist, um, this would be something that would, would haunt you, I would think, throughout your career because it, it, it shows a kind of moral failing that is likely to be repeated. And, and it affects the entire, it, it affects all sociologists that you would do this, you know, I mean, and I would think with journalists too, I mean, um, if someone does this and then there's not really any consequences and they win a prize, no less, um, it's as, the, you know, you kind of wonder, is it one of those, well, we stepped over the line, but we're back on this side again, and then it can continue. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is, I mean, what is the moral failing? Is the, mor is the moral failing, is it, is it as simple as just that you never would exhume a grave? And, that's, and some people have that view. That's not, that's not where I am. I think it's a much grayer area, uh, given the enormity of what had happened, given the, the poor record of law enforcement in Uganda, given the, the you know, one, one, is one, one, one example of, of, in this particular case, and, and I'm not defending, I'm, I, we, we took the thing down, we, we apologized for doing it, so I think it was the wrong decision. I don't want, I don't want to give the impression that, that, that I view this differently on having lived through this the last couple of weeks. But I will say that in the conversation, one, one of the issues that came up about the misstatements of, uh, alleged misstatements of fact, was that in the early captions of, of the, the photograph he had of, the, of Margaret Bibiri, the girl who was mutilated, the, uh, Marco had, said, had written in the caption that, that at the time of the exhumation, it was believed that she had been raped and that her heart and her brain had been taken out. And this one sort of fits into the ritual sacrifice where people were taking organs and, and, they, and for various reasons. There was a market. People thought, you know, believing in witchcraft of one kind or another, there'd be some value in these organs. So he'd written that. And then the, the head of the anti-human sacrifice uh, unit in an email to, um, to Marco, when Marco sent a draft of the story to, to make sure that everything was correct, the, the police inspector wrote back and said, well, there's nothing in the police record that shows, that indicates that A, she was raped or that her brain or heart were taken out. Well, Marco's you know, own image showed the, the back of the head is just open, it's been sliced open. And so, the, I then talked to the, to the police inspector. You, don't, you couldn't see, he had been told about the heart by the village elder and the mother, but when they exhumed the body, the girl was closed and you couldn't see her chest. So, you, so there was no documentation. Of that. There was documentation of the head. And I assumed, uh, wrongly, that, that there would be, that, the, that there must be a police documentation of this. And so I, I called the, police inspector and asked him for the details and I said, well, what does the police report? Do you have your own photographs from the night before when she was first found? And he said no, that he himself had not seen it and that the police had not taken any photographs. Now, the, so in that sense, he really did have visual evidence. And this is what Marco said he was after. That, 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 and and the, there is pressure in Uganda to downplay these cases. And so if he, in his mind, in his moral calculus, that he was helping the family to expose and force the public and force the government to confront this issue. So. This one back here. Hi. The, in, in your discussion, uh, oh, I'm Byron Knight, Wisconsin Public Broadcasting. In your discussion about choosing stories and looking for outlets for the stories, Pulitzer is a wonderful name in journalism and very respected. 
But you said that Pulitzer must spell out its standards to potential outlets. You mentioned the News Hour and some others. The News Hour, I know, has guidelines and standards. How much do these outlets tell you <laughs> what mm -hmm. standards they expect and how do you incorporate that into what you do? And it's not so much about your center, but there are other centers doing this and are they aware of the, mm -hmm. of the standards of the outlets? Well, this is, this is what I was trying to get at, that I think we need to be much, much clearer about that. And, I, and I, I had thought that because we were working in association with outlets like NewsHour, that, these, that there was an implicit understanding of what we meant when we just state that we were the highest journalistic standard. Well, that's, looking back, I think that's, not, that's way too simplistic. That there's some of the discussion that, that we had this morning about the need for more explicit guidelines as to what is acceptable journalist behavior and what is not in, in, in our terms. Uh, but we do, you know, when, when we work with, you know, the other part of it is just, you know, the, the value of sort of early collaboration with outlets. And you know, we want to leverage as much um, coverage of these kinds of issues as possible. We want to promote debate, we want to engage students and the general public. And so any time that we can get whether it's NewsHour or the Washington Post or the Christian Science Monitor or whoever, we are more than happy to, to you know, to, if we fund a project and then we, we, we will often take a project to an outlet, to an editor we dealt with before and we'll say, well, we've got this very good project on, on the UN Peace Building Commission in, in four African countries. Would you, Christian Science Monitor, be interested in this project? And, and, and we have a discussion. And then if they take it on, then we pass along. You know, we, we've, we've identified you know, either a journalist has come to us with a proposal for travel support, or we've actually gone out and we've recruited a journalist, often from journalists who worked with us previously and we know can do the work. And then, but it, as soon as we can, if we can bring in collaborators uh, who will assure the promulgation of their own values, which we share. I mean, I don't, I don't think this, I really don't think there's all that much dispute about what the standards are, and, and the, and, but we need to know that the standards are there. I just think that in, in retrospect, in this case, and in, in thinking through all of the implications, that that, that needs to be on our grants page of where, we, where we say what we're looking for, and if somebody, if somebody takes a grant from us, these are the obligations on their end, and then what our standards are in terms of the publication in general. And the other, and the other piece of that is just the, the fact that that with untold stories and the increasing amount of content that's on our site that is original, unique to our site. In that sense, we are, we are very much a publisher ourselves. Hi, I'm Lex Graves. I'm a UW journalism student. And, oh, thanks. <laughs> Can you talk about how um, even if you had fewer projects or more resources feeding the, the web's, you know, constant demand for new content and competition with other outlets contributes to your editorial decisions? Well, we don't, I, don't, I don't see the competition that way. I mean, we, we, you know, the projects that we do are long, you know, long form, long term, in depth projects. And so we're not, you know, we're not out there, we're not aggregators, we're not, you know, we're not trying to, to feed the beast in the sense of, of, of putting content up all the time. We're, you know, we're looking for, I mean, the, the, what we do tell our, our grantees and potential grantees is that the, we're interested in systemic reporting on systemic issues. We're interested in reporting that will be both original and in-depth and will have value not just next week, but next month and next year. And then, and then if you look on our site, particularly the Pulitzer Gateways that we've created you know, that look at, at climate change, um, women and children in crisis, um, food and water and so on, you'll see that there is a growing body of work, that we, areas that we've been sponsoring over the last four years where each of those portals has 8, 10, 12, 14 specific projects that we've uh, funded over the course of the last few years and continue to fund. And so those sites become richer and richer. If you look at, you know, the waters, the downstream is one that we've worked a lot with in the, in the past uh, few months. And, and there we've, we've done projects literally all over the world. And, and we have, and those projects have tremendous lasting value. And so we're taking them out to schools and universities and using them as a basis of discussion. But it's not, it's not about, you know, in, in terms of looking at the content and making sure that it's, it's, it's good and it's ready to be uh, featured on our site, we are as careful as we can be and we're not, we're not trying to put up anything quickly.
No, not quite. Testing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I get to la ask the last question because we're going to have to move on. I'm sorry, uh, but this has been very interesting. Uh, I want you to tell me what you learned about what pictures you will use or not use in the future. Uh, because you've taken some pictures down. I want to know why you took those down. Were they too graphic? I'm, I don't want to get to, I'm not talking about the exhumation mm -hmm. of the body. Uh, are you now in the future going to only show pictures that are not as graphic? And what does that mean? So what have you learned in terms mm -hmm. of your criteria for uh, appropriate pictures? I'm trying to find Well, in this, in this case, I mean, it was the exhumation. Um, and it's possible. I'm not saying that ever, you know, never in any circumstance would we, would we support that. But we would definitely not do it without a whole lot more discussion ahead of time and knowing exactly what had happened than, than we had in this case. So it was, the, as we said in the apology, that, that we concluded that it was, that it showed disrespect for the dead and that it, and that it was, you know, forced the family to suffer anew. The, the picture of the, uh, the picture of the three-year-old child who had been mutilated, the live, you know, that Mukiz is alive, and it's a, you know, full frontal naked picture where you see his face. And, and there it was just a, you know, our judgment that it was, uh, did not respect his dignity and privacy, and that even though the family very much wanted the picture distributed, uh, even though uh, as such pictures go, it's a very tasteful picture, um, if you can imagine. But we were moved by the argument, some of which we, you know, we encountered, you know, on the blogs. And as I said, I, 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 I want to acknowledge that that was a factor in our thinking because it raised it in, in, in the, the one, good, one of the few good things that came out of this was a sense of how this, this debate was very intense among a relative handful of people and on three or four photojournalism blogs that seized on it, and mostly by professional photojournalists of one kind or another. And, and so they, they were making some of the arguments, I think, were, were misstated and unfair, but there were a lot of arguments that had merit. And, and we heard it, and as a result, the, 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 those pictures were only in circulation for five days. And then they came down before we got to the point of, of mass distribution. And, and that's, a, uh, that's a value. It's a value of the, the way that the whole thing played out. Thank you very much for a fascinating session.